What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Uh, today we are going to wrap up our series on atonement. It's a word that means we are made at one with God. And the series is all about how we are made right with God. We saw in our first week that we can't earn the right to be made right with God. We can't pay money or beg. We can't even behave the right way to get right with God. It only happens through Jesus Christ. And it only happens when we ask and when we receive God's free gift of salvation. Last week we looked a little closer at this idea. If we can't earn it, then why be good at all? And we saw that even though we can't earn our place with God, there is still something we we do because of our place with God. Once we know we are God's child, we start loving the way that God loves. And that goes double for other Christians, those around us. The world will know we are at one with God because of how we treat others. We love without limit. Last week, my six-year-old stayed in church while my eight-year-old was in Sunday school. After the service, my two boys were talking, and I had ended the sermon with this really moving story about a man who gave up his life to save others on 9-11. And the older asked how church was, and I overheard my son Hal, my six-year-old, tell him, Dad cried in church. I promise, no tears today. This is all about the good stuff, how we have victory in Jesus. This sermon will be a little bit different as we explore different ways of understanding the atonement. Uh, And uh, let's now start with prayer. Will you pray with me? God, may we be an inclusive community passionately following Jesus Christ. Help us to have victory in you, Lord, even if there is so little we understand even if we ourselves are weak. We trust that you are strong. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we are going to walk through three different ways to think about atonement, and we can understand the first probably best through that story we ended with last week, the one about the 24-year-old equities trader who rescued up to two dozen people during the September 11th attacks back in 2001. Besides crying while I told the story, I've been thinking about how that situation came about in the first place. That young man had to rescue those people on 9-11 because some people decided to fly airplanes into skyscrapers. This is a truly evil and heinous act. There's only one result that comes from an action like that, destruction and the loss of innocent lives. Now usually when we talk about sin and the things that separate us from God, we stick with the things in our own lives. We don't point at others and say they are evil or fall short of God because that is God's place alone to judge that. But when we see real evil right before our eyes, we can't help but say that that is demonic. It's straight from Satan. Years ago when I first moved to Philadelphia from a nice suburb of Buffalo, I was definitely dealing with culture shock I moved to a row house in South Philly, and though I could get a great cheesesteak whenever I wanted one, there were also lots of problems in that city. There was obvious poverty, people cursed and fought a whole lot more than I was used to, and a gang of tweens stole my friend's bicycle while she was locking it up in front of her home. Even drug dealers and violence were regular features of city life. But the one thing I came across in Philly that seemed to me more evil than all the rest was some history that I learned about the city going back to 1985. It was in that year that the city's police department bombed their own citizens. Now, I know the relationship between the police and the public is a hot topic these days. Between defund the police and back the blue, it may seem like no good can come of talking about these things, but what happened in 1985 was totally different. A liberation movement called MOVE had a commune-style home uh, they were being evicted from. When they wouldn't leave, the police approached, there was tear gas, gunfire, and eventually a helicopter was brought in that dropped C4 explosives on the home. 
People blocks away said they felt the ground shake from it. Eleven people were killed, including five children. And as awful as all that is, what happened next is what will stick with residents forever. Not surprisingly, the bomb caused a fire. And the fire grew and grew until 61 homes were destroyed. The destruction that was left behind from one home, one group of people trying to be evicted from one home because of bad neighbors. The response was just not equal to the problem. And you can see here a photo of the two blocks that were destroyed from that fire. To this day, many people who learn about it are outraged. How could someone do this? My time in Philadelphia was nothing like that. My encounters with the police were always cordial, helpful, and professional. They have a truly difficult job navigating the tensions between people and the law. But what happened in 1985 was just evil, even if they didn't mean for it to be. When we talk about atonement, we are trying to reconcile these sorts of evil actions and being made right with God. Could the people who bombed those citizens and destroyed two city blocks have a right relationship with God? And the answer, I think, and maybe surprisingly to some, I think it's yes. And one way of thinking of this and how people are made right is called the ransom view of atonement. It means this, when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus died for us in all our sin in all our errors and mistakes and weaknesses. But instead of us suffering for all those things, Jesus does. Jesus essentially pays the devil so that eternal evil will not happen to us. Jesus suffers instead of us. We deserve it, but Jesus takes it on himself. He is the ransom. He is the deal that makes the devil go away. Jesus says himself in Mark 10, the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. In the book of Acts, Paul is telling his conversion story, and he says, Jesus came to him and said to him, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You can see how people would say, yeah, we are made right with God when the devil is paid his ransom. Now, some people aren't really comfortable with this. They say, why are we paying the devil again? The devil isn't in charge of this world. God is. If anyone needs to be paid, it's God because he is the judge. He is the one that decides what to do about 9-11 or bombings and, and burning of a neighborhood. So a slightly different version of the ransom theory is that the deal is paid to God. Jesus suffers on the cross so that God doesn't have to punish us. Personally, I don't really like that idea because it seems out of step with God's love for us. It's as though God is forced to destroy the people he loves because logic demands it. Uh, That doesn't quite seem right to me. Nor does God paying himself for a ransom. Uh, So then we have to ask, how do we get right with God if it's not by paying the devil a ransom or God paying himself to not punish us? Well, another way of looking at it is through the life of Jesus. What do we learn from Jesus as to how we get right with God? In Jesus, we see perfection. That's why Jesus can be put in our place in the first place. Jesus lives the way God would live. Jesus does the right thing. One of my favorite verses of scripture is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 4. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, to let the oppressed go free. It's beautiful, and and Jesus really does do this. 
we, uh, when I had just graduated from college, I was really unsure of the direction my life would take. I had three jobs, bills to pay, and no higher purpose. The one good thing I had in my life was a pastor who cared about me and got me connected with a feeding program in the inner city of Buffalo. Every week, I would make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, load them up into a camper, and drive downtown to hand them out to the homeless. For a while, I really didn't like doing this. Uh, I thought that maybe this was not the right thing to do because I was wasting my time feeding these people who would otherwise not be hanging out on the streets. They would not be waiting for these handouts from me if I just stopped feeding them. I had it all wrong, of course. People didn't want to eat my sad peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. They were forced into it because of the circumstances that were beyond their control. And as I got to know these people and to hear about their situations and their stories, I learned this, this about them. In the end, I feel like I really did make a difference. I helped feed people. I helped them get from one day to the next as a team of folks worked together to try and get people back on their feet. And why did I stick with it? Why did I keep feeding people even though I thought it probably didn't make any difference? I did it because Jesus taught me to do this. Jesus told me it was the right thing to do. He brought good news to the poor. He literally fed the hungry masses at the feeding of the 5,000 because he had compassion for them. That's the same impulse that got me out feeding people in the first place. And because I knew it was the right thing to do, following Jesus' example, I stuck with it. This is another route to atonement. It's called moral influence. Jesus, by his life and death and resurrection, has a profound influence on us and on the whole world. A righteous man was killed for no reason. That's a martyr for a cause. When we see this injustice happen, we stand up and we do what's right. We make a difference, we do good, we change the world. We are regularly looking at Jesus' example of how he lived, how he responded to people and situations, and making sure our own life models the life of Jesus. Here at Grace, many people respond with some of these ideas in mind. We are regularly collecting food for Kumak, a United Methodist organization that feeds 50,000 people every year. We have a pastor's discretionary fund. This is money to help those who are in need and people generously give every year so we can help those who need it most. Uh, We're even doing a collection right now for St. Vincent. Uh, Did you hear about that volcano that happened in the last month? People are in desperate need. In the bell tower here in the back, we have a, a, a collection that we're taking up and you can check that out to see what kinds of items you can collect to help those people. Wherever you see us taking morally positive steps, you can see us working to imitate Jesus. Now, I had a very interesting conversation with someone this week. They were talking about how Jesus is a model for how we live. And the person said something along the lines of, you don't think Jesus would ever own a gun, would you? And I said, well, yeah, he could. And this person was floored by my statement, uh, and I, I recognize that it makes for a very strange mental picture, Jesus with a gun, but hear me out on this. Uh, my wife's family is from Pennsylvania, and some of them are hunters. They shoot deer, and they process the meat, and then they eat that meat throughout the winter. I'm not sure I, think I see anything wrong with that. And the person said, when I sort of gave this idea to them, they said, uh, well, where does Jesus say it's okay in the Bible? And the honest answer is, he doesn't. But you can see things that might get you there. God says, every uh, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. That's Genesis chapter 9. And multiple times, Jesus tells the disciples to cast their nets into the water to catch fish. After his resurrection, he's cooking fish over a fire for them to eat. 
It's not direct, but you could see how someone might understand permission to own a gun and hunt with it. That's what moral influence does. We look at Jesus' life and we try and piece together how his life affects our own. We don't always get it right, but we keep working at it. The problem here, of course, is that we all fall short of God's goals for our lives. We never get it perfect. We are never truly moral in all our actions. So in the end, what good is our morality? Like we said last week, we can't make a bargain with God to be good enough. So there's one last approach I'd like to share today. This is called Christus Victor. It's Latin for Christ the Victor. Some say this is the oldest way to understand atonement. And in the scriptures, this is what we see spoken of the most. Jesus has conquered sin and death. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Jesus breaks this power over us. Jesus is not just a ransom or bargain with the devil. He is the crushing power that defeats Satan forever. Now, over in Italy, there is this tomb. Inside is a a man who died centuries ago. But when he died, he absolutely rejected the God of Christianity. He believed very firmly that he did not want to be raised from the dead. So he bought this enormous stone to cover his grave, to potentially prevent his soul from rising against his wishes. And then he had them write all over this stone markings that say, I do not want to be raised from the dead. I do not believe in it. But apparently, when he was first buried, a tiny acorn must have fallen into his grave. We think this because a hundred years later, after his death, this little seed had grown into a massive tree and it split that giant slab across the grave right in half. And you have to think, if an acorn... Just a tiny seed from one tree that God made can do that. Imagine what the resurrected Christ can do. We find power to overcome sin. We literally transform the way we think and the way we live because of Jesus. Many of us have radically different lives because we said yes to Jesus at work in our lives. Even the funeral that I am doing this week for a member of our church. We think differently about that moment because of Jesus. It isn't just death. It is eternal life with Christ. Even death is defeated when we trust in the resurrection power of Jesus. That's the meaning of atonement. When we are at one with God, the world around us is different. Even the meaning of death itself is changed. So whatever way you may understand this connection with God, whether Jesus takes our place or he shows us the way or triumphs over the enemy, when we find ourselves at one with the Lord, we find we have victory in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.